I want to know about the importance of sleep. I think we all know that sleep is important, but I don't think we quite understand the criticality of it to our performance, to our well-being, to even, you know, other parts of our life. Yeah, absolutely. We all know what it feels like to have to have a poor night here or there. And some of us who suffer from insomnia, chronic audition, they will know it much, much more. But because for some people it sort of happens here or there, the the lack of sleep isn't probably given and I'm careful with my words here, I want to use the word attention um, or rather maybe consideration. So what I'm getting at is that many of us, we get too little sleep on a regular basis almost every night. Now that sort of when I say too little sleep, that could be maybe half an hour, an hour shorter than what we need, right? In itself doesn't sound like much, but if I think about sort of five nights of a working week where this for sure will happen, that could be five hours of sleep that we are lacking. Now, we are unlikely to make that up over the weekend. You know, quite on the contrary, we may lose even more if we're going out, seeing friends, theatre, things like that. And then comes Monday and we do exactly the same thing, you know, shorter sleep. So this lack of sleep accumulates and that accumulation, yes, will have an impact on on our body, on our body, on our performance, on our emotional well-being. Most of these things, apart from the tiredness, we don't notice right away or we've become in a way used to it. And by used to it, that we kind of take it as the status quo, right? Um, But nevertheless, the impact on our physical health, for example, continues to happen. Our performance that we can't think as flexibly, for example, or not as creatively, we can't think on our feet we're we're much more inclined to think sort of in in straight narrow lanes um so all of that will have an impact and then final one is our emotion and well-being and that could be you know anxiety sadness anger irritation that's showing up for us and that of course will have an impact on our relationships with our friends with our family you know with someone at work with someone in the shop it doesn't matter you know it will have an impact on those relationships as well is there a fixed number of hours that everyone should be sleeping or does that vary from person to person? Very good question. So that varies from person to person. The the media loves to say we all need to sleep eight hours and ideally we'd be sleeping, I don't know, 10, 11 p.m. until 6 or 7 a.m. in the morning. Um, And that is true for some people and probably the majority of us need something like eight hours, but not everyone. And so each single one of us has to find out how much sleep do I need and what are my sleep times? I call that the personal sleep window. You know, am I more of an early person? Am I more of a late or somewhere in the middle? You know, and it it will vary a little bit as we go through age. I mean, you know, clearly children, they need quite a lot of sleep. They go to bed early. Whereas, you know, older people, they need somewhat less sleep. Teenagers, they go to bed very late and they want to wake up late, not because they're lazy. It's just how their body clock ticks. So there is movement within that nothing is is rigid um so it's just being aware hey what are my what are my needs and how can i support the fulfillment of these needs how do you know how much sleep your body needs like what your specific needs are is it a way to determine that because some people can really just keep sleeping if you don't wake them up they they are more than capable of sleeping for more than 8 hours so is there a way to really determine because i would guess even too much sleep on a regular basis could be bad for you i'm just guessing but is there a way for you to determine that this is how much sleep i need for optimum performance to maintain my well-being yeah absolutely and i want to come back what you just said about long sleep right too much sleep just like too little sleep is bad for our health um we have more data on the lack of sleep and how it impacts us but the data that we have also suggests too much sleep has has got a negative impact and it might be that this sleeping too much is associated to underlying health conditions and so they become worse it's not quite clear exactly how it works but the data is there to to say exactly that um now your actual question how, how do i know um well the the easiest way is to take five or six day holidays 
and, and stay within your time zone. Don't go and travel because we don't want to sort of get a jet lag. Um, be mindful of your your phone use, particularly in the evening. Be mindful of, of drinking and so on and so forth. And then just go to bed as and when you feel tired and get up when you wake up. Now, as I've ex explained before, most of us carry a sleep debt that we get consistently too little sleep. Um, we have to repay that, at least in parts. And so on the whole, after five, six nights, that should be repaid. And then you know what your sleep need is and what your sleep times are. So sleep debt, we can make up for it over the weekend. Like if Monday to Friday, I am getting, I'm only getting five hours of sleep, but my body is asking for more. I can sleep more over the weekend. Is that something that would work? Yes and no. Um, so one, there the are different studies showing slightly different things. Um, if it is a one-off, that for one week it was particularly stressful and you get a number had a number of short nights, I would say, yeah, sure, slowly, and this is the key word here, slowly repay by going to bed half an hour earlier, maybe having a lion for half an hour. If you can have a nap in the afternoon, great. And then the next night, again, half an hour earlier, half an hour longer. Not these long three hours extra sleep. That will confuse your body clock. So that's an entire internal timekeeping system up in your brain. Uh, and if that gets confused, for example, that's what we see with shift work, um, that again can lead to poor performance and ill health. The other problem that we often have is that we sleep one way too little during the week. Then we think, oh, weekend, we make up for it. And then comes Monday, we do exactly the same thing again, too little sleep. So there's a yo-yoing. Again, that's not good for our health and well-being. So the best really is, and that's the most boring piece of advice I give is keep your sleep times as regular as you can. Fully acknowledging, you know, that we all kind of, for whatever reason, will have a late night or very early start. Happens to me just as well. But then just trying again the next night, okay, let me let me be on time again. Okay, okay. I have a question here. Uh, so I'm part of a certain mental health forums, like and we would discuss amongst ourselves like what our sleep habits, our personal habits are to take care of our mental health. And I, I've shared on the show as well that I sleep for six and a half hours. Like if I go to bed at nine, I'm going to get up at 3.30 and I'll be alert. I'll be good to go. No struggle with waking up. No problems there. And then there are people in this group as well who would say, oh, I can get up. I'll get up in five hours. and I'm good to go. I My battery is recharged. And five hours seem very little to me and six and a half hours seems little to other people who sleep eight hours and they would say to me that you think six and a half hours is all you need because your body really has adapted to that but if you were to now adjust to eight hours uh, of sleep and eventually get, uh, get used to sleeping that much consistently you'll see a rise in your performance your cognitive performance i don't know if that's true it's an experiment that seems unnecessary to conduct because to my understanding when I wake up after having had six and a half hours of sleep I'm good to go I'm fine I don't feel any lag till like I reach uh, 7 p.m in the evening right and that that's actually your, your most telling piece of um I was gonna say data here that you feel fine yeah right for most of the day, like you just said, until 7 p.m. So if you don't require a lot of coffee or other stimulants, if you don't find yourself yawning or feeling sluggish, and bear in mind, we all have a dip around lunchtime. For you, if you get up around 4 or 5 o'clock, that will happen probably a bit earlier than 12 um, noon, but it doesn't matter. So we all have that dip that, that's there. But if you, on the whole, feel good and energetic within yourself, then then I would say, you know, that is probably the sleep you need. And these are your, your sleep times. I'm assuming you're not waking up with an alarm clock. You're just waking up by yourself. Yes, mostly, yes. But if I have an interview in the morning, I'll just to be on the safe side, I'll have the alarm on. Yes. Yeah, yeah, understood. Again, if you just check your, your environment, so no alarm clock, if it's darkish, if it's quiet, so if there's nothing external that wakes you up, if it really comes from from within, then that is most likely your your time. It is on the shorter side. However, the National Sleep Foundation in the US, the recommendation for um, a healthy adult of our age, so the middle age, 
is between sleep between seven and nine hours, acknowledging some people may only need six and some may need 10. Right? Um, so the person who sleeps five hours, I would ask a few more questions to look what's what's going on. But from what you are saying, this is what's right for you. Right. Equally, may I just ask one more question? When you wake up, do you have the option to stay in bed? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that's there, right? So you're not shortening your sleep because you're starting work an hour later, as in you don't have to start work an hour later. Um, so you have a big enough opportunity, and your body is just picking. Yeah. Yeah, Night and until thirty o'clock. For the first hour of my my first hour of the morning, unless I have a podcast interview, if I don't, my first hour is very mellow, very low energy. I usually do yoga, meditation, and then after that, I I pray for the next uh, one hour is like sweeping the temple, then saying my prayers. So the first two hours are very very mellow. I'm I'm working after that, and I keep working till ten a.m., which is when my you know everyone else is up in the house and having breakfast. So then I join them um, for that. By that point, I, I need like a little shut eye, get like 15 minutes of shut eye, and then I'm up again and back to feeling energetic. So that definitely is there. But yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry um, too much there. Okay. Okay. So the data that you've shared, does that, is that specifically for people of a particular location? Does that apply to everyone? And does that vary for either genders? So that is very generic data in the sense of applies to everyone. So all they have done is um, they've looked at different age categories. So starting with newborns, toddlers, young children, I guess, teenagers, adolescents, um, up onto older, older person, older people, I think they refer to say, and older people for them is over 65. Now, is there a differences between the sexes, between male and, and female? Um there are certainly differences. Some some studies sort of seem to suggest women need a little bit more sleep than men. Um, it's not by much, should it be true. I think really the key is to listen to your own body. What is it that, that I need? Where we do definitely see a difference um, between the sexes, between male, female, is when it comes to sleep problems, and particularly when it comes to insomnia, so chronic sleep problems there we see an over indexing of of women which could be to various you know for various factors first of all biology so our our menstrual cycle pregnancy menopausal transition but also women have a higher incidence of anxiety and depression and anxiety and depression they sort of go hand in hand with sleep problems with insomnia then gender norms, you know, it's typically in a family, the mother who will get up and provide nighttime care for the children. So that's another disruption. Um, so, yeah, there are lots of reasons as to why we see that that differences between between the sexes, between the genders. Yeah. Last month I had a chest infection. I slept for nine hours. I was so surprised. But I guess that's what my body needed. So Exactly. And I you are so right. Sleep is the thing that you need. Like I believe that my, my chest infection went on for nearly three weeks. The doctor told me it may go on for more than a month. But I think because I canceled all of my commitments, I canceled a lot of my commitments or I moved them to the evening time. I was able to get a lot more sleep than I was getting otherwise. Although, you know, like I said, I was fine. I six and a half hours more than enough for me. But during that period, I was sleeping for eight hours. Um, during my when I had my period as well during that time I slept for nine hours I think the sleep was what helped me uh, recover from the infection a lot sooner than what the doctor had predicted the amount of time that it would take me to recover I think it was the sleep that helped me more than anything else yeah it's it's a real period of rest for the entire body and well how much the mind rests we we can only speculate but given that there is a lack of data input the mind will also have a chance of, of resting and if you have an infection by resting by sleeping your body can really focus on that one task in that moment to fight that infection rather than having to deal with so much else 
Yeah, makes sense. But, but that uh, makes me want to ask you about the mechanism of sleep, like the different stages of sleep, because we often see the data, like if you have your own sleep data, like if you're wearing a uh, tra- health tracker, it will give you those sleep stages, but it's very hard to determine what that means. And then even though you slept for an adequate amount of time, it will score you very, it will score you less on it because it says that, oh, you didn't get enough REM sleep or you didn't get enough a deep sleep. So can you explain that briefly? What does that mean? And what stage of sleep should we get, should we be getting a lot more of? And is there a way to manage that? Yeah, yeah. So I think there again, it's it's really confusing. Again, the way things have been reported um, isn't isn't necessarily what, what really matters. So anyhow, we have, when we sleep, we go through different sleep stages. And very simply put, we have light sleep, we have deep sleep, and we have REM sleep or rapid eye movement sleep. Um, and we cycle through these three stages during the night. So we go from light into, into deep, um, and then we go back into light, and then we go into REM sleep. And this this cycle takes about 90 minutes. And at the end of such a cycle, we briefly wake up. We briefly wake up, but it's so short that we're not really aware of this waking up unless we need to go to the bathroom or you have insomnia where the brain may hijack this normal awakening. But for most of us, we briefly wake up a few seconds, almost like roll around, and then we do the same thing, go into light, go into deep, light, REM, brief wake up and we do that maybe five six times it depends how long you you sleep for right that is the pattern that we want to see now what also happens is that in the first half of our sleep so if we take the average eight hour sleeper roughly in the first four hours we have more portionally more of the deep sleep than of the REM sleep but then in the second half that changes we have much less deep sleep and much more REM sleep, which is why many of us wake up out of a dream or wake up still remembering a dream because we're most likely waking up out of REM or close to a REM phase. Yeah. So there is this change from a lot of deep to a lot of REM. Um, if we look at the proportion of all three stages, light, deep, and REM across the night, um, we spend about 50% in light sleep. 25 in REM, 20 in deep sleep, and that leaves 5% for these wake-ups that I mentioned. Now, the media portrays the deep sleep as the number one sleep stage we all need to get and we all need to get more of. However, in a normal sleeper, it takes up only 20%. So don't quite know where that is coming from. In each stage, our brain body, they do slightly slightly different things. So deep sleep is important for growth and repair. And I guess that is why the media sort of goes, ah, you should get more of the deep sleep. It's important for, yeah, as I said, growth, repair, memory consolidation. However, memory consolidation starts in the light sleep, right? And we need that light sleep almost like a lead in to kick off the memory consolidation. And that then also continues in the REM sleep. Right, slightly different memories become consolidated. REM sleep also seems to be important for the processing of our emotional experiences. It's a bit like REM sleep takes the sting out, takes the intensity out, that when we experience a similar situation, we don't react as strongly uh, in that. Um, So they do slightly different things. And for me, I think all of them are equally important. Right? They build on each other or they complement one another. So they're all equally important, really. Okay, so this obsession that some people have, like they're calculating, they are obsessively tracking their sleep, is that necessary? Or <laughs> can we just, you know, try and get good sleep and leave leave it at that? Yeah, absolutely. And that is right when your first question, or rather my first answer, I was very careful with the word attention, giving sleep attention. Because if we give sleep too much attention, if we obsess about it, then sleep actually leaves the bedroom. Right. Um, so sleep is a natural part of our lives. Our body, our brain knows how to sleep. Right. They, typically, they know that the more we try to get sleep, the further that goes away. The more anxiety there is in the system, the more worry there is, 
the further sleep goes away. And with the sleep trackers, I mean, they are getting better and better, um, but a lot of them aren't very accurate. And so for my clients, if they have a tracker, I say, yeah, absolutely, you know, let's use it. But first of all, check in with yourself how you feel rather than waking up and immediately looking at the data, you know, because you know how you've slept. You don't need a device telling you. You, you, you can judge that by your emotional state, by your physical state. Um, so find to use both, but don't kind of rate one higher than the other, I think. Any sleep tracker that you found to be more accurate than the others? Yeah, so I, I don't use any. Um, and also I, you know, <laughs> that doing advertising. So um, I, that's, I think, for everyone to find out what, uh -huh. what they resonate with the most, whether it's something, you know, like a wrist-worn watch or something under the pillow, under the mattress, lots of different ways of, of looking at it. And I think we all just have to do a bit of an investigation, what we feel sort of can measure it the best for us well i use a garmin watch uh and i love my watch like i love the tracking it does for my um, exercise my step counter and all of those things my heart rate my vo2 all of that is awesome um, i've had like my cholesterol has come out to be really high so i've been using this to get my health back to a good place for that, I love it, but my health, the, the sleep tracker seems way off because I would get get up in the morning, I would be feeling great, and then later when I would check my watch, it's like, oh, you had poor quality sleep, you need more. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. It's consistently way off. It doesn't seem accurate. So I would say that, though. So I just stopped looking at that part of it. I'm like, my body can be a better tracker, so far as sleep is concerned, at least. The rest, of course, you know, you great to have a health tracker, but... I agree with you. Sleep trackers are not very accurate, but maybe they'll get better. Yeah, I think that they, they they have already evolved and they will for, for sure. Um, I think even when they are much better, it's still important to listen to oneself, right? That that sense of what's going on in my body and mind. You know that the best, better than than a device. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, so far as insomnia is concerned, before we go any deeper into uh, you know what sleep does for us can we please talk about insomnia because i think there most of us would assume that insomnia just means that you are not getting any sleep at all but you mentioned that people who are having insomnia may be having more sleep of one kind than the other like more light sleep than deep sleep could be so insomnia is a bit of an umbrella term for different symptoms so it it can include struggling to get to sleep. So a lot of my clients that take hours to fall asleep, but once they've fallen asleep, they sleep. Or you fall asleep fine, but you wake up at some point during the night, maybe just once, maybe three times, however often, and then you, you struggle somewhat to get back. And then third option is waking up too early. So too early before your desired wake up time. So that's sort of roughly. And then you have an impact sort of on the following day in the terms of tiredness or, you know, emotional upset or performance issues. So that's kind of what the symptoms are. And to sort of define chronic insomnia further, that sleep problem has been going on for at least three months and three nights or more during a week. So that would then classify as chronic insomnia yeah, that makes sense because i think we, we all have periods of insomnia when we are having high anxiety or just there's a lot going on so that the, the criteria to judge whether you have chronic insomnia that makes sense and that's an important point to note have you been able to narrow down the causes for insomnia or could there be like a number of reasons that lead up to it there are so many <laughs> um but I think anxiety about whatever, as in whether that's in your personal life, whether that's around your health, whether that's work-related, the state of the world, who knows, um, that's a big one. Stress is probably the biggest factor. And what we often find, and you in a way just said it a moment ago, you know, we, we all experience sort of transient insomnia, a few nights, maybe a week of, of poor sleep when, yeah, stress levels are high. And that's often how it starts. Then that whatever, let's call it, event that you perceive as stressful, once that has passed, um, most people will go back to sleeping normally 
But for, for other people, there's this worry, oh, what will happen tonight? Will I sleep tonight? And so this original worry about your stressful event, that is replaced with worry or anxiety about not sleeping. Right. Um, so that's that's often what happens. So there is something happens in life, some stressor that disrupts sleep, completely normal. But then what sets in is a worry about not sleeping, having another horrible night and another horrible day. And then very quickly enter a vicious cycle. I want to talk about possible solutions, but we'll come back to that later. Before that, we already discussed sleep stages. I want to know about circadian rhythms. So circadian rhythms, um, sleep and wake, the rhythm of sleep and wake is an example, probably the best known example of a circadian rhythm, but we have lots of circadian rhythms in our body. So it starts with the circadian clock, and that is an area up in our brain, about 50,000 cells, and they sort of are the master clock of your body. They set the timing within your body. And based on that timing, all your organs, for example, know when they have to perform and when they can have a rest. Right? But it's not just your organs. It's almost every cell has a mini clock in it, but they all are orchestrated by that clock up in your brain. And so for me, the best analogy I can give is that of an orchestra. An orchestra has a conductor, that's your master clock in the brain. And then we've got all the different musicians and they can play beaut beautifully, but they need that conductor to tell them when to play and with whom to play and when they have to be quiet, right? So for example, your stomach, your stomach has to be ready for food intake when it's light outside during the day. But when it's dark, that can actually shut down. Right. Similarly, the heart that needs to be ready to work harder during the daylight hours when you're active, and then it can sort of not shut down, <laughs> slow down uh, when it's nighttime. When you have an infection at nighttime, right, all the immune cells, they will fight pretty hard. Right. But during the day, they might sort of take a bit of a rest. And so all of these, like I said, all the different organs and cells, they, they all follow a rhythm and they are also timed toward with, with, with each other. Um, and so what we find in people who work shifts or who cross a many time zones, there is a mismatch not only with the person and the external world, but also within the person. Um, different organs, different systems will be on sort of will follow one sort of time zone and others will follow another time zone. And that's where we see a higher incidence rate of certain diseases in certainly shift workers and perhaps also people who do frequent um, uh, travel. Okay. You really brought home to me just how critical uh, circadian rhythms are. I always, I, I remember just referring to these as like the bylaw, what manages the biological clock which I get, but I never quite got the criticality of them functioning as they should or functioning in a healthy way. To what extent does sleep impact your circadian rhythms? Good question. So the clock, like I said, the clock will tell, let's just say, the organs when, when to work, when to be sort of resting. And in the same way, it, the clock is involved in telling the body now it's sleep time and now it's, now it's wake-up time. And certain processes will happen when we are asleep, while others need to happen when we are awake. Now, if I suddenly change my sleep schedule, um, the body clock may not know that, right? Because you're making that decision, I'm staying up later or something like that. Um, the clock doesn't know it. So the clock will initiate certain for certain um, processes to start and for others to end, which which would make sense if you were asleep, but they don't make sense if if you are awake. Right. So like I just said, sort of that the heart may work a bit slower at nighttime. But if you then suddenly continue out dancing, that heart has to continue to work harder, which means it gets less of a rest phase across the 24 hours. So uh, that, that's what's, what can happen. So basically, if we deprive ourselves of sleep, we're depriving ourselves of rest and also certain processes that usually happen during that rest period. Okay, so what can we do to improve our sleep in a way so that it keeps our circadian rhythms well regulated? That is my boring advice from earlier on. Find out what your sleep needs are, how many hours and what time, and then stick to that. 
So for our biological clock, the circadian clock up in the in the brain, what that wants is regularity, because that clock will tell each part of the body what to do and when to do it. And in order for that to happen, it needs to make certain predictions, right? Um, and in order to make this these predictions, it uses um, light. It loses you. Sorry, it uses natural daylight. And so what happens, and I didn't explain this early on, so I mentioned the clock up in the brain. Now the brain is pretty dark, right, a dark box. Um, in order for that clock to know it's daytime or nighttime, it needs information from the eyes. So in your eyes, you have a special photoreceptor, not for vision, simply for light detection. And when these cells see light, they pass that message to the clock, and then the clock is like, oh, okay, so it's daytime. And then it will tell the body, body, it's daytime now. You know, all daytime workers go, as in do your work. And when it goes dark, again, those cells in the in the eyes will tell the clock, hey, clock, light's off now. And then the clock is like, okay, body, it's now nighttime. Every nighttime worker, now you go to work. Okay? So that's how the clock, how the clock knows. Um, and the clock can also make sense of the changes of light levels and the spectral contribution. So to us, the light very much looks white. But in the mornings, we have actually more blue light, more short wave lengths light than for the rest of the day. And the clock can perceive these changes. And then it knows, okay, so we're approaching the morning and now we're approaching, let's just say, lunchtime and so on and so forth. And it can always send messages to the body, okay, now you can step down and you have to step forward. So that's how, how the clock knows. And so while we talk an awful lot about how important natural daylight is, Darkness is just as important because that also tells the clock something, right? That it's time for sleep. And so that's where we want this, this regularity of sleep times. Get up at sort of your regular time and go to bed at your regular time. Yeah, that provides the clock with a regularity and then it can base everything else on that. Okay, so if somebody is waking up every day, not going out like a remote worker, perhaps someone who works from home, is not going out, not getting sunlight, That's that would be bad, I'm guessing. Yeah, but research data is showing, yeah, exactly, that that can have an impact on sleep, possibly or mood. Mood can impact sleep, sleep can impact mood, so there's different versions. But there's um, a few studies from the US, uh, and one looked at office workers, where some office workers had their desks by the window, and others had their desks sort of more inside. Um, those who had the desk by the window had better sleep quality than those who had the desks sort of more in, inside the room, right? So we, we, we know that natural daylight matters. I mean, that's just one of, one of many studies. The best thing I, I always say, even if you're working from home, is to make sure you spend some time outdoors, preferably in the morning. If not, go and do it at lunchtime. To if your body clock the chance of really being reassured by that day indeed has started. Now, you might want to ask how long. The honest answer is we, we don't know. Um, if, if, you, if you at the moment don't go outside, if you go straight from bed, breakfast to your desk, maybe start with five minutes or 10 minutes yeah, and then increase by another five minutes so maybe that you get to half an hour even if it is 15 minutes in the morning 15 minutes at lunchtime perfectly fine right um start with small steps but spending time outdoors ideally not with uh, sunglasses because they will reduce the amount of light getting through your eyes also not necessarily under a roof because that again will stop how much light you get into your eyes. Now, I'm not saying you have to stare into the sun. That's not healthy. But just, just making sure maybe you, you, you're out there and you do get some sun uh, in your face. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take your advice because I get very little sun in the morning. I'm going to try and get more. But yeah, that, that makes sense. Do all of these suggestions that we see online for artificial light, for exactly what you're suggesting to remedy that issue in a lot of people's lives, like a lot of people are not getting enough sun. They're so busy. They're going from task to task. The day starts and a lot of people really just don't have access to not don't have the possibility of being out, you know, in the morning. So then these artificial sources of sunlight, is that as effective? 
Yeah, absolutely. So the, the um, daylight lamps, for example, um, or SAD, seasonal affective disorder lamps, my own PhD used light boxes to improve the sleep of, of my volunteers. So they absolutely can. I think you just have to make sure you, you buy it from, you know, a, a recommended provider, not just any odd light source. It, it has to be, you know, one of a certain of a certain standard. Um, so and then expose using those and exposing yourself to that light, you know, for it will vary depending on the light maybe half an hour, 20 minutes in the morning while you're having your breakfast or breakfast, or you have it on sort of next to your computer screen for half an hour in the morning. Um, absolutely, right? Um, they do they do make a difference. Okay, that's reassuring. I felt embarrassed asking that question because it seems lazy not to get, not to just go out and get the sun. But yeah, for a lot of people, it really is not an option. So uh, that's reassuring that there are these options that we can use. But yeah, we have to make sure that we get the right product. So that makes sense. Do you know of any mental and physical illnesses that are specifically caused by sleep deprivation? Because we often talk about how anxiety and depression can lead to uh, insomnia, but is could that ever be other way around? Like if you have sleep deprivation, it's going to lead to any specific mental and physical issues. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a two-way street, right? Lack of sleep can lead or contribute to anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, um, lots of mental health, physical health conditions. Um, would I go as far as saying the poor sleep sort of on its own triggers these mental health conditions? Not too sure. I'd be careful saying that right. because often there are several factors, could also be genetic factors, but poor sleep for sure is one of the contributors to to poor mental health. And I guess we all know this, right? After a poor night or two, you know, we feel sluggish, we'd be a bit more grumpy and irritable or sad, you know, anxious. And then as soon as we get good night again, these symptoms go. But if our poor sleep continues, that will continue to have an impact on our mood, on our emotional well-being. Um, and can then absolutely, like I say, contribute to uh, diagnosis of anxiety or depression. I'm often very skeptical of these articles that I see online that really, I feel like they're catastrophizing when they talk about how uh, constant, like c- continuous sleep deprivation can lead to, um, like, like it, I don't want to say what the specific stuff that I've read because they were not very reliable sources, but they will talk about how it can even lead to cancer, how it can lead to these very like schizophrenia. One of them mentioned, and to me, a lot of, I, I, I'm not a doctor. I don't have that kind of knowledge, but I really wondered all of these articles that catastrophize it. Are they catastrophizing or have there been cases, even if they're rare ones, or like, I don't, I don't even know if there's a way to find out if, that could ever be something that would at least exacerbate the situations to that extent. A lack of sleep is a known risk factor for all of these conditions that you just mentioned. But like I said, I'd be careful to say it's the single factor causing that. That's where I would be very, very careful. So just because you have insomnia or poor sleep doesn't mean you will get Alzheimer's certain other factors also have to be present for for that to happen right? but the way i see it is um when i wrote my book the the image i wanted i didn't get it but anyway the image i wanted was that of sleep resembling a, a foundation and then on that you have the pillar of of health as in physical health uh, emotional health and mental well-being or or performance right so but sleep is the foundation these pillars rest on. And when that first foundation starts to crack, it will have an impact on those pillars. They're not standing as solidly anymore. And then those pillars maybe start to crack and one falls onto the other. Foundation is still there, but the foundation is cracked, right? So that's that's the image I have in, in my head. Sleep isn't the only single thing, right? Again, just because you have irregular sleep doesn't mean you will get diabetes, but if you have irregular sleep and a high sugar diet and maybe genetic predisposition, it makes it more likely to develop diabetes. So I, I, I hear you and I agree with you that catastrophizing isn't isn't helpful because it just makes people anxious. <laughs> and for sure, they get a sleep problem and so on and so forth. Um, 
But equally, we have to recognize sleep is foundational and it is something to take care of, but take care of it as a normal part of life, not something that's up here on a pedestal. I'm so glad that you explained it the way you did, because we're always so dismissive of our sleep. Like if there's ever a very lengthy to do list, we take time away from our sleep. That's always the first go to option. I mean, I've not seen any data, but I can say that with a lot of confidence. You know, I've been a student, I've hung out with other students, I've been uh, an employee, I've hung out with other employees. I run a business, I hang out with other business owners. That's always, always the first thing we do is we cut down on our sleep. Okay, for now, I'll just get four hours and I'll try and function on that. And it is just so dangerous. Everything you've explained up to that point and, and the example that you just gave, that image, it's, it certainly helps me get a lot more clarity around just how critical sleep is. And it makes sense considering it's impacting so many of your other functions in your body it would make sense that it would then, you know, be a massive part of what leads up to you having these major ailments. Yeah, exactly. And what you then also bring in or have to look at is the disruption of your circadian rhythms. So you, you can disentangle lack of sleep from disrupted rhythms. You can do that through, you know, clever studies. But often we have both of that happening at the same time. And as I said before, when I was describing the circadian rhythms and the different organ, you know, Coming back to the orchestra, each musician knows how to play. But if there is no conductor, they will play sort of randomly and it's not a nice, beautiful song any longer, right? It's rather the opposite. It's a bit of a chaos. And the exact same thing happens or can happen in, in your body right? and then lead to ill health. And now I have to ask you about alcohol and drug use because I know a lot of people drink alcohol at night thinking that they're going to get better sleep does that work and to what extent uh, do these things interfere with your sleep performance yeah so alcohol is a soporific meaning it can help you to fall asleep um however while it can help you to fall asleep it often disrupts the second half of the night and reduces the amount of REM sleep that we're getting and I explained earlier on REM sleep one of the functions it has is to help us process our emotions which if we get less of that, it might explain sort of the effect of the hangover and the grumpiness that we have after, you know, too much alcohol the night before. So on the whole, alcohol is a bad idea for our sleep because it reduces the quality. Now, a large number of my clients will have tried and some are even still using alcohol. They're not alcoholics. They very much drink specifically in order to get to sleep either in the evening or at night when they wake up at 3 a.m., they have a glass of whatever alcohol to help them get back to sleep. Um, and at the same time, it rarely helps. It may be helped, and I'm careful with that word, in the beginning, but by the time they come to see me, that is no longer, it's no longer helpful. But it's a habit. It's something they keep clinging to because there's the fear. If I don't have that, my sleep's going to be even worse. At the same time, many say I actually don't want to do this. So, yeah, alcohol, really not a good idea. That's not to say don't drink alcohol. I enjoy a glass of wine on the weekend, absolutely. I just know that it could impact my sleep. So I'm mindful of how much I drink and when I drink. And if I do choose to have maybe three glasses, because it is a party, a birthday, some event, then that is part of this event, part of me enjoying this moment. Right? I won't do it the following night. I'll go back to putting my sleep first the following night. So, yeah, like I said, there are no hard rules. It's just being aware of how does this impact me and do I want this or do I not want this? Okay. And the medication that a lot of people take, could that interfere with sleep? Yeah, so some medication, you, you, it will say, you know, under side effects, it could cause sleep problems, could cause insomnia. I'm not a medical doctor. Um, and you know, for me, always this in this medication is given for a reason. Um, so let's take that. Um, is there something that we can do about the insomnia? So there are two parts to insomnia when it is caused by medication, right? That medication can cause it. But then what my brain makes of me waking up or me struggling to sleep, that's another layer. And that layer I can work on with a client. Okay? Um, so that, yes, I have this disruption. That is because I'm taking this medication. I have to do it because of X, Y, Z reason. I'd rather sleep. I'd rather not have that 
illness at all, but this is where I find myself. Now, I've woken up. What's the most helpful behavior I can do right now? And that will be different for different clients. If you ask me, it's about resting. The next best thing to sleep is resting. right? And so then we have to find, okay, what helps me to rest? And again, that will look differently for different clients. Um, and so overall, what happens is, yes, the person has woken up, may be awake for an hour or two, but because they're more in a resting place, they're much calmer, they're more relaxed, right? And so maybe they drift in and out of sleep. Certainly, they will save energy because as soon as I struggle with my sleeplessness, I use up energy, like in any argument, whether that's with another person or with myself. If I'm arguing with myself, I'm using energy. I become irritated, anxious, sad. I become alert, right? And that is the last thing um, we want when we're talking about sleep. All right, that makes sense. And this reminds me of this one thing that I, you have already talked about how critical sleep is to our circadian rhythms, to the performance of like a right, proper performance of our body and the different systems in our body. I remember I suffered from massive hair loss and one of the doctors told me that, are you getting enough sleep? I was a student at the time and I was like, no, I'm not. It's not an option for me. I have to study all night. So I get very little sleep. I only sleep when I'm like totally exhausted. And he was like, oh, till, till you start sleeping regularly, you're not going to be able to, like your hair loss is going to continue because your body during sleep time is giving you your energy back. And it, it will go to the parts of your body where the functioning is critical, more critical than hair growth. And I remember that staying with me. Um, that is something that I think would be appreciated by my audience. We can talk about that for a minute because a lot of my the people who listen to the show are very mission oriented people. They've got big goals. But again, we have so much going on. We want to up our performance. So we use supplements. We're doing some people are doing psychedelics. Some people are experimenting with different forms of exercise and whatnot. But if you are taking away from what you just mentioned, the fixed amount of energy that you have, if that is not getting sent to those parts of you where you are demanding the most performance, and I'm guessing this is not something you can decide on your own, then that is a problem. And that is something that only the solution only rests with how much sleep you get and whether you get enough sleep or not. Yeah, absolutely right. Sleep is your, your recharge time for your body, for, for your brain. And you can do with a, deal with a short night and probably two short nights. Um, but if that continues, it, it, it doesn't. And we really have to ask ourselves, what, what matters in life? And if it is my career or my family, well, how am I going to support my career? How am I going to support my family? I need to support myself first. If I fall off the bandwagon, that's it. There's no one to have a career, right? Or there's one person less to support the family. Um, so if I don't look after my own well-being, others will for sure feel it or my career will for sure feel it. It's the long term that we have to look at, not the short term. We have to look at the long term goal here. What is it that I that I want? And what is it that's truly helpful um, for for me? And for me, the, the sleep is just the the normal natural sort of performance support not even performance enhancer because it's, it's just what actually allows me to perform yeah yeah i uh, read on this forum about this person who was starting to forget things like he would walk into a room then he would walk out having completely forgotten why he was there in the first place then one day he forgot he had a hard time recalling his kid's name and he freaked out so badly. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I forgot my own child's name. And then he went to a doctor and they ran an assessment on like different sorts of tests. And they were like, are you getting enough sleep? And he wasn't. He was going through a very busy period at work and he, he like corrected that. And within, I think it said, I don't remember whether it's at six weeks or six months, but like a prolonged period of prop getting proper sleep, correcting that imbalance, there was no bigger issue. It was just he wasn't getting enough sleep and that was affecting his memory to that extent where he actually was forgetting 
such important details on a daily basis. That's that's crazy. <laughs> that is it's crazy to me. Yeah. And if you have a strong um, inner inner critic or self criticism, you know, forgetting your children's name. Whoa, what a bad parent am I? I am such a bad parent. You know, how can they love me? You know, that's awful. I forgot that. Right, and then you have the inner critic going. Inner critic and good sleep, they don't really go well together. It's either or, I find. So that can quickly actually drive this. So I would say fantastic that this person went to the doctors, you know, to talk about it, to look at this, what's going on here, and then to kind of take steps to improve their sleep. Yeah. But sometimes the sleep changes are beyond our, the sleep changes and the sleep challenges are beyond our control, especially when hormonal changes happen. And I want to talk about that. Uh, do they, when they happen with women, we talked a little bit about what happens during your menstrual cycle, but we'll talk more about that as your hormones changes change. And is that specific only to women? More so, I, I, I would say, right? Because we have we have the, the menstrual cycle that happens every month. We have the menopause, you know, almost every woman, female, will experience to what length and how early and what severity that that varies but they they are big events happening again and again and again and yet yeah, a big part of that is due to hormones and the, the sex hormones you know they impact lots of different cells in the body in the brain including those involved in the regulation of sleep but also the body clock and so if these hormonal signals become weaker or they fluctuate, sort of they're not as reliable as they usually were, then the brain, the sleep center is a bit like, what, what's going on here? What's needed right now? The info isn't as clear. Let's maybe go to bed, but then let's wake up three hours later. Right? We can imagine it's a bit like, a bit like that, um, what's happening. But what's also happening is related probably to the hormonal changes is the impact on mood. And again, mood, poor mood, as I said before, um, uh, and poor sleep, they show up together. So there is a lot. And then maybe there's pain um, as well. For some women with the menstrual cycle is pain and pain is discomfort. So again, that can disrupt sleep. So there are lots of sort of roots how this can happen. They are somewhat all related, but yeah, there are several um, of them. What is the most helpful step you can take as you're going from one stage of life to another? Because I know people get very attached to these labels of, oh, I'm a morning person. I like I was very quick to offer up this information. Oh, I only need six and a half hours of sleep. But I've been told by a lot of exercise instructors that if you're stepping up your exercise, let your body sleep as much as it needs to sleep. Forget how much you needed before let your body now tell you how much it needs. Because if you're starting to run again, if you're strength training, et cetera, et cetera, your needs are going to change. I'm guessing the same would apply to your changes in hormones, changes in your body of that level. So should we be that attached to our ideas of, you know, our sleep personas, so to say, or we let our body let us know what's going on? It's exactly the latter. Let, you know, listen to the body, which is why listening to the body, not necessarily that device on, on your wrist, um, listen listen to your body is, is the most helpful thing you can do. And it's also when I talked about um, sleep window and some people are early, some people are late, somewhere in the middle, there is movement, right? It's not that you're fixed in one category. Now, an, an early person is not going to become a late person, right? But there is a shift within that. It's a spectrum. And I, and I shift along that there is some data that suggests that up until the menopausal transition women are early men are late right so on the whole right um but then after the menopausal transition something something happens and maybe women become a bit later or maybe women, men become you know of that age become a bit um earlier but there again there is there is movement right so um same thing we mentioned earlier alcohol Typically, on the whole, we're better able to tolerate alcohol when we're younger than when we are older, right? So there's there's always change within us. But we humans we very much like to attach labels to us, or put ourselves in a category that gives us, I guess, some safety, some sense of stability. Uh, nothing wrong with that as long as I leave the door open and allow myself to transition into a different category, right? 
So I'm getting at this, what I'm getting at is flexibility, really. That's, that's the key. And flexibility involves listening to my body, maybe collecting a bit of data. So again, having these health trackers, nothing wrong with them, right? Long term, they give me some data. Um, because then I can see, ah, there's something that is changing here. How can I best support this? And you're absolutely right. The more exercise you do, or certainly when you ramp it up, there is a period where your body will need more sleep because there's a change on energy demands and so on and so forth. There's more repair to be done, right? And then, you know, once your body gets used to this new level of or intensity of exercise, most likely sleep will drop down again a little closer to what it used to be. So I just have to ideally allow my body to make these changes. Yeah. I think today uh, people in our generation are very, they're very eager to control everything. And because of technology, we feel like we really can control everything. So is it possible to, this is just a question that I, you know, ask every doctor I meet, every health expert I meet, um, is it possible to really you know, be like this complete architecture of your self, like control all the processes, manage all the processes in the way so that they're working to your requirements. Is that possible? I'm in the camp of uh, saying that you can't control everything. You have control, but that control is, is, is limited, right? The body you've been given is the body you've been given. The genetics you have is, are the genetics you have. You can't just change them or, or control them and sleep is a great example of a natural biological process that's outside of our control the more i try to control my sleep like i said the further sleep will step out of the bedroom so even sleep medication sleep medication prescribed by a, a medic they don't reliably offer sleep i'm not saying even good sleep they don't reliably offer sleep i hear clients taking the same medication same dosage different different experience that they that they have um you know so it really is about learning and accepting and that's a big big word for me acceptance is learning what can i control and what's outside my control and then to accept what is outside my my control and acceptance is not resignation it's not tolerance um it's a much more affirming way of of being um but it has a huge sense of reality checking, right? This is where I find myself. This I can't control, but this I can control. And what I can control is always my behavior. I, I would say you can't control your thoughts. You can't really control your emotions, right? You can tell yourself, don't be anxious, don't be anxious, don't be anxious. Most of the time you do remain anxious. And if not, you get angry because, you know, you're still anxious. And so on and so forth. Um, so what you really can control is your behavior. How do I want to respond to this thought showing up, that emotion showing up, or this person showing up, right? or whatever else is happening in my life? How do I want to respond? That is under your control. And what I see in my practice with clients, when they reach that point of saying, this is within my control, they feel empowered. Because they're crystal clear on what's outside and what's within. And that within is where their power lies. And then they can take that step forward. I welcome that answer. I really do. Because I have been on that path where I'm like, oh, I'll take this supplement and I'll do this exercise and I'm going to manage this. But then every, at least for one week in a month, maybe it's I'm guessing it's because of the menstrual cycle, my body is like up to its own, like it, it just refuses to cooperate. On any front, for at least one week period, I just simply do not have nothing works to works how I want it to work. So that made me give up the whole thing. I was like, okay, let's just do our best. Let's eat healthy. Let's exercise how the doctor has told us to exercise, and and let that be it. And yeah, I, hats off to people who can do it, who can really stay on top of all the data, and who can really what. I, it just created a lot of anxiety for me. I, I didn't did not enjoy that. So I welcome the advice that you're giving. I think that's the way to go. And can I ask, how is it now when you say, we well, use the word giving up, but sounds also like saying, okay, well, this is not within my control, but what is within my control is how I exercise when I when I have my, my period, for example, right? So again, you got clear on what's within, what's without. And I wondered, how did that 
how did that fear from previously trying to control everything and then anxiety, how, how is it now? It's so much better because I think I did a lot of, I made a lot of changes in the last three months. I, I shared with you, I got that medical report with my cholesterol numbers uh, borderline high and that freaked me out, especially when the doctor said, unless you lose your weight, unless you lose this extra weight, uh, you're going to be put on heart medication. I'm 32. I do not want to be on heart medication. That freaked me out. I don't know if I should be sharing all of this or not. I don't want anybody out there getting triggered by what I'm sharing. Um, but I'm just saying that this really freaked me out. I stepped up my exercise. I started really reading all the data. I started control, trying to control my sleep. I'll sleep this many hours. And I started running. It's excessively hot in India right now. I was running outside after a really long time, getting a lot of sun. It was, it was so dusty. Not at any point did I stop to consider that many changes are going to hurt. And I got a very, very bad chest infection. I, it just it completely threw me for a loop. And when I, as I recovered from it, it was the sleep that helped me, but also it was letting go that helped me. I was like, I'm going to take my medication. I'm going to eat nutritious food. I'm going to eat lots and lots of fruits and salad, and I'm going to take it easy. It was difficult to do, but that is what worked for me, letting go. And now I'm like, okay, today I did extra strength training. Like if I do more than 60 minutes, I'm like the alarm clock is, if I have an interview, I'm not going to do it because then my alarm clock controls how much sleep I get. So it, it's letting go. It's letting my body decide how I feel before I go to bed, how I feel in the morning, how much food I should be eating. I let my hunger pangs decide how, how hungry I actually am. I'm going to eat exactly how much my body needs or a little less than that because that's usually the advice you get. But no, I don't. I, I could do it. And, and I feel so much better for having made that choice to just let my body tell me moment for moment what it needs. Pressure is off. That's what it sounds like to me. That, yeah. that, that an extra layer of pressure yeah. has been taken away. And there's sort of a <laughs> relaxation, right? Yeah. Opening up. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, in many, many ways in your life, including sleep. Yeah. I do understand the impulse to do this. I do understand the instinct to do this because, you know, I got my test results. I freaked out and I felt like I needed to do this. So I understand why people do it. I understand the urge, you know, maybe you need, you have a lot of demands on yourself. Maybe you really, you're sick and you have the kind of sickness that requires that level of control, but I do understand it. So I don't judge it, but I just, my heart goes out to anyone who is in that position and does not have that option of, as you said, uh, you know, relaxing about the whole thing and just letting the body dictate your choices. Yeah. Yeah, and I think just on that, because you're right, control, our society also kind of suggests if you don't like something, if you're facing a problem, go and fix it, change it, take control. Right? How often do we hear that, take control of the situation? And I'd say there's nothing wrong with that unless it's about sort of more internal matters. Um, then that control approach may not be the most helpful one so again it's about checking in is taking control actually helping me here or is it costing me right so that like there's nothing wrong with control and it is something we instinctively try to do it's just checking in is this actually helping me or or not yeah that makes sense can we please talk about what like solutions there are what strategies there are for improving sleep quality Anything from diet to exercise, technology, anything that you can share with us will be most helpful. So it will depend a little bit. What is your sleep problem? Where is it coming from? What's the what's the severity? But I think you just mentioned the diet, right? Diet is important. It's what you eat. It's when you eat. In the same way that we have a sleep window, we have an eating window, which ideally shouldn't be longer than 12 hours, ideally less than that. Again, see where you are right now. It's There's no use if you have a 13-hour eating window and say, oh, I need to go down to eight within one week. It's not going to happen, right? So slowly, slowly cutting back. And I don't know many people who have an eight-hour um, eating window. But, you know, see what works for you, but kind of then once you have it, be as regular as you can. And then, yes, healthy diet. You just mentioned that a moment ago, right? Healthy diet matters for many, many things. And since we know that many things impact our sleep, by eating healthily, the body will be in a more healthy state and that will be supportive 
you know, for, for our sleep as well. So if I eat food that I have an allergic reaction to, so some people can't, you know, very well digest milk products, cow milk, for example, or spicy food for some people, it's an upsetting stomach. Well, there's no point in you eating that for, you know, closer to sleep time because it's most likely, you know, that you will have a poor night. Um, so that exercise, we know exercise matter, but that's not just time in the gym, that's generally moving throughout the day. So we know long periods of sedentary behavior, long periods of sitting down is associated with poorer quality of sleep. So, you know, some a physio will tell you something very similar, like get up every hour because of posture, because of spine, because of, you know, generally your um, musculoskeletal system. So it's just following that healthy advice. Then another big one for me is the exposure to light, ideally in the morning as a natural daylight, and then making it dark in the evening. Now, I'm not saying make it dark at 8 p.m., pitch black, because you know then you will walk, fall, break your leg, and that's no good. Um, but just being mindful of particularly electronic devices in the evening, so your phone, your laptop, your, your tablet, unless worried about a TV. And just also being mindful, does it need to be so bright in this room, or can I dim the lights a little bit so that I can still see you know, and walk safely, but do I need it as bright? And then also, can there be a cutoff time for my phone or my laptop? Whatever time that may be, that's what you, the person, have to decide because it has to work for you. And even that, let's just say you say, okay, after nine o'clock, I don't use my phone. That's not a rigid rule because if you are waiting for a particular message or a particular email, I'd say it's better to check, right? Then you know whatever answer and so on and so forth rather than going, oh, has this come? Has this come? I don't know. Oh, but I can't check my phone because Kat said I shouldn't be checking my phone. Oh, but I really want to. Then that's tension, that's worry makes you know makes it harder to uh, fall asleep or stay asleep so that's there then I think social support a lot of clients will talk about loneliness and isolation and some are isolated by themselves others will have a family may even have a bed partner but still feel really alone with the experience of poor sleep or with their worry in life so finding ways of, of building a supportive network where you can truly show up that can have a positive impact on on your sleep um, as well. And then I think um, is I come back to the regularity, right? Finding what is my sleep window and then really sleeping within that window or allowing your body to sleep within that window as often as you can. And if if you go to bed late or if you have extra a sort of very early morning, perfectly fine. Just go back to your normal sleep times the next night. How else can people learn more from you? Any resources where you would like any resources that you believe are particularly helpful so far as this, you know, sleep, our sleep, sleep struggles are concerned? And is there a way to work with you? Absolutely. So I work with, with clients on a one to one basis and it's all online. So I can work with people from all over the world. Um, and my specialism really is on the insomnia. So the struggle to get to sleep or waking up. And what I do there is. Yes, we look at what's happening at night, and often there is a racing mind in one way or another. There are some uncomfortable sensations, emotions. Again, varies from client to client. There's something there, and we learn ways of responding to that. But we also look at the day, because for me, night and day, sleep and wake, they form a cycle, right? They follow, they precede one another. And we always have to look at the waking day, what's going on there, what are the pressures why is sleeping poorly just so bad? But, so we explore all of that. And then we go. I go back to that word acceptance and, and control. What can I control? What can't I control? Right. So that my client gets the sense of empowerment, really. Because when I feel empowered, I feel safe. When I feel safe, it's much easier to sleep. So, yeah. And the best way to get in touch is probably um, via my re um, website, drcatsleep.com. Just send me a message or, or book a call. Um, or find me on Instagram. But yeah, I think website's probably the, the best, the easiest. Okay, I, I'm going to, as always, have these links in the episode description itself. Um, what controversial and surprising findings in sleep research that you have read or that have emerged recently that have really like changed things for you? Oh, very good question. Um, well, there's this one, one piece and that goes back to 
sleep being important for our performance, so performance at work. Um, and then we're thinking of um, entrepreneurs. And what one study is suggesting that short-term sleep deprivation, so sleep deprivation doesn't mean you're not sleeping at all, you're just shortening your sleep, that short-term um, sleep deprivation may actually have a benefit for entrepreneurs um, in in setting up their business, um, maybe innovation, but sort of to kind of entrepreneurial uh, intentions, I think is what they say in the paper. So that's a bit of a sort of counterintuitive twist. It's so far just one study, um, but it kind of makes me think, okay, um, is it best helpful right to condemn all type of sleep deprivation or not. And I think long-term regular chronic sleep deprivation absolutely is bad, but a poor night, a single poor night in the grand scheme of things, I don't think that is bad. Right? I'm not advocating having poor sleep or shortening your sleep on, on an ongoing long-term basis, but I think having a poor night here and there, it's not at the end of the world, our body can can deal with that, right? I wouldn't seek it out, but if it happens, it happens. And then let's just treat it as that. Yep, that has been a poor night for whatever reason. Maybe I know the trigger, maybe I don't. I'll go back to, you know, my normal sleep tomorrow night. I think that's that really is the key. And that goes hand in hand. What I often, often say to clients, sleep is important, but it's not up there on the pedestal, at least not all the time. What's on that pedestal varies. Sometimes it will be your health, it will be your family, it will be your job, then it's sleep again. Right? It's not always that sleep needs to be the top priority. It just needs to be somewhere high up there. Yeah, that's that's helpful. I think a lot of people would have appreciated what you've just shared because we do feel guilty about missing out on our sleep, but sometimes there really is no other option. And I I have I know people who use REM sleep to ideate, to create, to innovate. I don't know how to do it. I've never I've not been able to do it ever. I've tried it, but I don't know how they manage it. That they they're disrupting their sleep. They have these sounds that go off at particular uh time periods so that they can get up and they can take down notes or I don't know how they do it. Uh have you ever tried it or have you ever known of anyone who has been able to do it? Any advice you can offer to our to entrepreneurs or creatives who are listening we never never met always just sort of hearsay from from others um it may work for some people but i think you have to have a lot of um you have to put a lot of work into it again how much you get out short term maybe it seems like a lot long term that's always my big question is that the, the long term of of this of this behavior um, will will that will that help so we've reached the end of this video thank you so much for watching and for sharing your time with me the video description will have the link to all the resources mentioned during the conversation and if you would rather listen to these episodes then you can find experimental podcast on most podcast platforms if you enjoyed the video please do share your thoughts in the comment section and if you want to watch more subscribe to the channel please and do hit the notification bell i will see you again in the next video till then please do take care of yourself bye